action. So with the um, so with this environment that was happening down south with these artists, what I found was there was down a, south. You're talking about Soho, New York. Soho, correct. So Soho, Tribeca. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a NoHo was another one, but it's yep. the Bond Street area, East Village. Mm -hmm. um, there was a very um, lively type thing that I think I have more of a voyeuristic approach to life. I like to watch what's happening. And through watching it, I tend to pick up things a little bit more about um, the ambiance, perhaps, versus mimicking or wanting to be what somebody is. I tended to see what these people were doing. And uh, I wasn't so interested in the lifestyle as much as what the quality of how they were spending their time. So what I found most interesting was here I'm, I'm, I'm addressing an issue of Madison Avenue, but on the other hand, I'm also seeing this lifestyle down in, in Lower Manhattan and Soho in the art districts, perhaps. But money has already come into the 80s. So the Hamptons are alive now, you know? And you have people living in very exclusive lofts that not many people can afford. But in the days of Jackson Pollock and even more recent in, um, at, the, at, the, at the time, uh, Robert Rauschenberg and, and um, Jasper Johns, they're living in cold, cold flats, but not anymore. The 80s has changed it. Money's in the flux now. But there was still a rawness if you went over to the East Village. So even though Basquiat, when I got there, was already wealthy at the time, his roots are still in the grunge you know, of, of the town, but the more raw aspects of it. So what I was noticing was is that lifestyle was easy to mimic and play, but there was still work to be done. And the work to be done, I didn't find myself going out clubbing and going out and doing stuff. There was something that involved a lot of time and a lot of effort. I think what comes about sometimes is that people see what they think is going on and they perform that thing versus the thing that's going on that has nothing to do with performance at all. It has to do with your skills, your attitude, your personality being put to task. I find that I'm more comfortable in that realm. Um, I appreciate what people do and what, they, what they've become, but that's them. I'm not so much interested in what I want to become because that's kind of like a moment-by-moment -moment activity. But what I thought was beautiful was um, these, these artists that had the edge were also showing up on 57th Street. So there wasn't the distinct separation between the high and the low anymore. The low was going to the high and the high was coming down to the low. So you had this kind of tangible interaction happening, which I thought was um, intriguing. So it let me kind of fit in with people that were on both stratas. So for me to work for George Kondo, for example, um, there was a great admiration because here's this really low key, very intelligent um, gentleman doing art that was very questionable from my perspective about refinement and quality, yet his recognition was being accepted at the highest institutions. The Whitney, the Guggenheim, the Metropolitan, the Modern, he's being acknowledged on these high stratas, which really made me take a step back and realize that um, the quality of the image um, has different ways of perception. You know, like a, a rough, rather distorted, crude looking painting might be remarkably sophisticated. Yet I might compare that to a Leonardo or a Rembrandt and say, well, that's very sophisticated. How can this new contemporary art possibly be that? But the way these artists were thinking was. Their image wasn't always representing it, but what they were thinking about how they were doing it. Well, I'm not university trained, so I didn't have that academic scholarly perception or insight to the work. I was looking at it purely as aesthetic. I can remember one time going into the Modern Museum of Art, coming up the escalator, and I was confronted by a beautiful painting that was not holding the standard, and yet I'm in an institution that meant if there was something on their wall, it had to be fulfilling something. And it was um, a Cy Twombly painting that looked like a child had painted it, and a child that was maybe disturbed in class and being put in a corner to execute this um, exhibit of frustration and anxiety and everything, but yet the word Achilles was written into it. 
and a child doesn't write the word Achilles. And especially um, your opposite hand bent backwards to write it to where it comes out in that kind of crude approaching way. And um, it made me stop and think again that my whole idea of what art is, is in check. And I'm not the one doing the checkmate, I'm in checkmate. And it's like, everything that I'm appreciating about art has got to go out of the window. There's a new way for me to look at this. It's not necessarily to accept it, but it's to understand there's something I don't understand. And that seems to be the challenge that I look for. I like not being able to do something. Let me, let me change the, the direction a little bit uh, uh, and, and move to the present, uh, Scott, and tell us about this show, uh, a series of, of drawings, your drawings, that have been developed over a long period of time, a decade uh, and, or more, and, and, then, and, then I, and then I'd like to even go into uh, the, your eggs because they are, they are delicious and wonderful and just <laughs> a spectacular. Uh, and, and, I, and I don't think, I think underappreciated simply because nobody's seen them uh, to, to any extent. So, to, 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 so let's go into these drawings now. I mean, you've just come off a big, big, big show here in, in Dayton with uh, several hundred pieces uh, uh, of, uh, well, not monumental size, but some pretty big, pretty big pieces uh, 10, 15 feet, uh, you know, five feet, but, and, but, but now we're looking at, at the heart. Now, so what is the soul of these drawings? What is, what is the trends, what is this about? <clears throat> I'm gonna have to chronologically bring it a little closer uh, to the present. Um, the drawing started um, probably about April 2017. Oh, okay, I thought it, there were some that were older. Good. And the, um, I had drawings that were previous, but they were really just me doing um, f freehand characterized, you know, just something to draw a face, but not a representational face. Um, but with the politics of the day and just the, um, the conversations that are taking place and the, the invested interest in, into the ideas of people and you know, kind of the shaping of philosophies or points of view, that, that seemed to be a little um, interesting to me to watch again. I'm not so much looking at the sides of political persuasion as much as putting myself, I'm concerning myself right into the middle to where I want to see what's going on to the left and right as something that lets me observe both sides instead of just choosing one side or the other. So what I found myself doing is for a, a too much time being very captivated by watching TV. I mean, I just found myself spending hours, not so much getting my opinion, but hearing the exchange of information that was taking place, and it just was nonstop. And um, I like to be at my studio working, but I found myself really wanting to invest my time watching these programs. So what I found after a certain period of time that if, um, if I go to the studio, that I'm missing what's being said, and so I had to figure out a way to justify being at home watching the TV. So um, what I decided to do was create a justification for it. I could have just drawn while I was watching, but I wasn't going to be able to look down and draw and create because if I start to create something and innovate an idea, I shut off everything. My senses will shut down everything, and I'm just focused on what I'm doing, so I won't hear what's going on. So I didn't want to start creating imagery um, intentionally because I was captivated by the TV. I needed to merge. So what I found that I would do was um, do something that was difficult. In school, you learn how to contour draw. You know, it's a hand-eye coordination drill that you do. They do what's called blind contour where they put the paper over it. But I wanted to do something a little bit more authentic and not academically um, induced. So what I figured was, I'll draw with my left hand, since I'm right-handed, and I will, as authentically as I can, try to draw for 30 seconds the person speaking, not the um, head commentator or any of the high-profile figureheads. Um, I wanted to just get the people that were conversing. So I would spend 30 seconds drawing them and never look at the paper. So I, if I didn't remember I drew one of the eyes, 
I might get a third eye or one eye, depending on where I wanted to go, or get my two eyes because I did finally draw one. But these drawings at the end um, <clears throat> were very disconnected. And that wasn't satisfying enough for me, so I started to render them. But I rendered them traditionally. I had an unorthodox approach with a traditional rendering, but that I not it wasn't good enough for me. So what I did was I ended up developing a mark that would let me authentically do something uncomfortable, render to my highest degree with an uncomfortable mark. Um, and I would spend six hours doing that. So I could hear and do something totally focused, listen to what was going on, not be inventing or innovating anything, and being able to exercise my time in a way that I thought was worthwhile. But it was just to draw. Um, I have about 80 of these drawings right now. Um, they turned out different than what I expected. Um, I, for a name to understand what I'm doing, um, I called them opposition perception. Because I found with them being so disconnected with the drawing technique, they started to be a little bit disturbing looking. The little disconnected, little monstery, but they weren't characters. But a humanity has popped out of these things, which was unexpected. So. As you were saying at the beginning, things unexpectedly happened. I had an idea just to, to make myself be productive, but because of being serious about what I was doing, not judgmental, but serious at the task, it, it, has, it has evolved and into something that was a little bit more profound that I wasn't expecting. And I think that profoundness is I was starting to see people who de depict the opposite party are starting to um, see monsters and yet there was a humanity in that. So my wish is that no matter how people judge the opposition, and I'm not political, um, is that there's a humanity that has to stay intact with that. So those drawings are what are, I'm, I'm exhibiting and um, I don't think I've given away too much on it because they are visual events. When how you see how big are these drawings? They're small, they're very intimate. So they're, you know, um, within an eight by 10, you know, format. Some of them are a little bit smaller. Um, after a certain time, since they're all ballpoint pen executed, um, I started to bring in some things, some challenging events. I started to bring in my knowledge of Leonardo da Vinci and the fumata and this hazing of lines, but I didn't want to haze the lines. I wanted to eliminate lines. So here I've got a drawing that's 90% contour, yet the rendering has removed all of the lines, except the lines that I want to give evidence that these were once contour drawings. Um, I'm amazed. I really wasn't expecting to do anything except produce this body of drawings that weren't going to go anywhere. But I started showing people these peculiar little drawings that I was doing, and the response has been so um, interesting to me that I figured perhaps I had underestimated them a little bit. And um, I thought that was a fair enough game to be able to present them to the public. Very cool. Yep. Very cool. And the eggs, on the other hand, those are um, events that have, <laughs> without being redundant, another unexpected little coup of something you know happening. Um, I think the, re the, the benefit I get from doing an egg has nothing to do with holidays, even though they had thematic type approaches, I think because I started it on a Christmas Eve, um, unintentionally. There's a beautiful adventure that takes place with a surface that doesn't have an edge. Um, I think the images that I'm doing on an egg have nothing to do with what I would do on a flat piece of paper. And there's something very captivating about working in a way and intuitively honest, which I didn't realize, um, I had done a series of lighthouses and someone asked me how I got them so perfectly centered on the axis of an egg. And I had never thought of that. And once they told me, I had to stop doing them because they all became crooked. <laughs> <laughs> That's my attention went to it. And I didn't realize that there's an intuitive bead that has to do with an innocence 
but not in ignorance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I immediately jumped off of anything that had to do with straight lines because, I mean, there was a, a vast, uh, I would like to say I'm a wizard or a master with eggs, but I'm afraid it's the egg and just an honest approach again that when you're doing something that isn't intentional, there seems to be something that comes out of that that intrigues me. I tell you, I'm more of an enthusiast towards the art making process than a, a confident, competent painter or artisan. You know, I'm I'm addicted to the to the adventure of making an image. Yeah. yeah. It's it's uh, yeah. It's it's interesting the the life that we live in this world of art uh, and art and artists. Uh, sort of a pet peeve of mine. I have a hard, hard time with the word artist because I'm not sure what an artist is. All I know is that, 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 that there's a creative pulse uh, that works and I don't really have to understand it. I just have to let it happen. And, and I don't know if that describes, people ask me all the time, well, what's your process? Well, you know, uh, I'm a craftsman, uh, you know. Whether it's art or not, somebody else is going to determine that. I think I have a good one for that. I, I'm, I'm trying to look at certain things like attention, you know, and perception and these types of things, but not in a way to kind of go off the grid or go into the, the realm of, you know, of a, you know, the ether or anything like that. But I find that attention um, allows you to perceive what makes something, what is the making of something versus the, the, the glance by or the superficial assessment. So I, it, as you were saying, you know, what's your process? I think the process is the attention that you put to what you're doing. Process might not be the term. Um, and that attention, I, I was thinking more about the eggs again. At a certain point, I wanted the quality of the egg to be able to have something that was harmonic to, if I put this on a creek bed, like on the edge of a creek with a bunch of stones, would this egg and what I put on it be foreign to the stones? Or would it vibrate with the stones? You know? And what I want is I want, if I look at a stone, it's a gray stone. But if I look closer, that gray stone has flickers in it or different colors that might have been, not been noticeable at first. And if I notice a little bit closer, it might not just be two colors. There might be a whole arrangement of different colors that I just said was gray. So the attention for me to look at the detail of that stone, not to find detail, but just to pay more attention, brings more knowledge to me. So I think craftsmanship is a, a, a term that is really quite good. Not craftsmanship to get it done, but the craftsmanship of what it takes to make it that ends at a certain point. And so when you look at what's done, you see the attention to the craftsmanship versus I painted that picture. Like, so I, I, I find myself having a standard and that standard is if I'm gonna do a face, the closer I look at that face, I'm gonna to have to pay more attention to the details. In, in the more I pay attention to the details, by default, my attention is expanded and the face gets a little bit more attention to the details, you know, and it starts to go that way. Or on the other hand, I can be superficial and just whip that baby out. You know? <laughs> sure. So I think um, that's yeah. quite beautiful. <laughs> As our view will be going to looking at this abstract essence of what is, what are they looking at that's about, the, it must be the camera person. 